I open today's service with a prayer written for the holy and faithful people in Christ Jesus in Ephesus. I pray that the eyes of your heart will see what is the hope of God's call, what is the richness of God's glorious inheritance among believers, and what is the overwhelming greatness of God's power that is working among us believers. Welcome to today's service of worship. Special welcome to those of you who are visiting with us today. If you haven't already grabbed the pew pads, please grab those, fill those out, pass those along. It's a bit frustrating, a bit sad that the storms caused us to transfer from outdoor worship here into the sanctuary, but it is a blessing, a joy to know that we do have a nice, beautiful facility to worship in and that we have a beautiful parking lot that we can drive on out there. Northeast Asphalt came in and early Monday ground down what they needed to top layer and was able to get new asphalt and patch the areas underneath that were bad. They had everything done by Tuesday, got way ahead of schedule. We were anticipating it would be more towards the end of the week. So God knows what was going on in the bigger plan of all of this. So between the rain and cool weather this past week, it's safe to drive on. Please use caution, though, in the week ahead. If it does get a little bit warmer, it might get a little bit softer. So if you're driving in here for meetings this week, make sure your car is moving before you turn the wheels. Otherwise, it can leave some marks and kind of dig little holes in it. So let it get solid. It's a beautiful parking lot. This afternoon, uh, the organ recital that was planned down at St. Patrick's Concert Hall has also been canceled. But this Thursday, the next one, Kenneth Hill will be playing at Cathedral Church at St. Paul. So please take advantage of that over the noon hour if you can. The session meets tomorrow night, so please offer some extra prayers for them as they discern all that's necessary for the spiritual journey that God is leading us into. Days, months, years ahead, whatever it is, God knows what it's planned for us. Those of you who are elders, uh, you should have received your session binder. In the email, there's also the new job descriptions that Personnel Committee has in envelopes in the office. So before you leave this morning, if you want to grab those and keep those to yourself, but that way you can look at those before the meeting and get some insight on that one as we move forward. Next Sunday, we're going to be having a congregational meeting immediately after worship for the simple purpose of electing some new officers, four deacons and two elders. In accordance with our governing rules, nominating committee has presented a session of full slate of names for the openings that we have. The nominations will also be taken from the floor. Um, that option will be available next week as well. Those being nominated for deacon would be Stuart Castine, Kim Miller, Kay Mullins, and Wendy Peachy. And those nominated for the election as elder would be Todd Hayes and Terry Rain. So please keep them in your prayers and be here next Sunday, ready to vote for all of that. Next week is, a, next Sunday is a busy day. Immediately after we get done with worship at one o'clock, PYA meets at the Woodlands, and then at three o'clock, you're all invited to come back here for my official installation service. So Dave Colby, our interim general presbyter for Winnebago Presbytery, and Matt Sauer, the, our current presbytery moderator, will both be here, as well as many others from the presbytery. And I've asked Reverend Mary Council Austin to give the sermon for my installation service, so she will be the guest preacher for it. And if that isn't exciting enough to entice everyone to come, the Loving Team is providing cake afterwards. So if you come to that, then you get some cake afterwards. So lots of things going on, many other things. Take a look at all the information that gets sent out. I want to invite Jolene to come up. She wants to share some more information on another exciting event. Maybe even more exciting than my installation service. Oh, I don't know. Good morning. Good morning. How many of you know that we're going to do a little trip to the Dax Spiders game on July 14th? Okay, we've done this for a couple of years. It's a lot of fun. We um, meet there at the Philippines at 1 and 5. So we'll get there a little early. Um, parking is kind of free. 
so you might have to walk a little bit but it's a lot of fun a lot of camaraderie it's twelve dollars for a ticket there is a sign up right here I don't see many names on it yet but it'll be out at the welcome table after service so please sign up it's um, twelve dollars for a ticket and you can pay um, either in the church office or you can just grab one of the envelopes in the pew and um, put it in there so I hope a lot more people sign up because it really is a fun thing, a lot of good camaraderie in that. So if any questions, you can ask me or somebody else from the loving team after worship. Okay, thanks. Part of me wants to ask Chris to play some good ballpark organ music as we bring in the light of Christ, but that, yeah, okay. Let us prepare our hearts for worship as we encounter the light of Christ coming into our hearts once again. The light of Christ and the ringing of the bell. Please rise and join me in the call to worship. The church is the place where the broken gather. Let us worship God who reconciles us to one another and to God. The church is the place where sinners are welcome. It's us in the new people. The church is the place where the lost, the least, the forgotten, the ignored gather. Let us worship God who looks at us with the eyes of love. Holy God, we gather today to celebrate your presence in the lives of faithful people. Open the eyes of our hearts that we might see one another with your eyes. Filtered by the forgiveness of your crucified son, Send your spirit to meet us here and guide us into your depths so that all we see is born out of your abundant grace. Amen.
The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Let us continue in silence in prayer. In your mercy, O Lord, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a possession, in position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. As those who are in Christ, know that you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of Jesus Christ be with you. I invite you to share the peace of Christ with others. May be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Psalm, Psalm 92, verses 1 through 4 and 12 through 15. This is found on page 738 of the Common English Bible. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, Most High, to proclaim your loyal love in the morning your faithfulness at nighttime with the ten-stringed harp, with the melody of the lyre, because you've made me happy, Lord, by your acts. I sing with joy because of your handiwork. The righteous will spring up like a palm tree. They will grow strong like a cedar of Lebanon. Those who have been replanted in the Lord's house will spring up in the courtyards of our God. They will bear fruit even when old and gray. They will remain lush and fresh in order to proclaim, the Lord is righteous, he's my rock, there's nothing unrighteous in him. Our second scripture reading for today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 as we continue through this chapter. Listen for the word of the Lord. So we are always confident because we know that while we are living in the body, we are away from our home with the Lord. We live by faith and not by sight. We are confident and we would prefer to leave the body and to be at home with the Lord. So our goal is to be acceptable to him, whether we are at home or away from home. 
we all must appear before Christ in court so that each person can be paid back for the things that were done while in the body, whether they were good or bad. So we try to persuade people, since we know what it means to fear the Lord. We are well known by God, and I hope that in your heart we are well known by you as well. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again. Instead, we are giving you an opportunity to be proud of us so that you could answer those who take pride in superficial appearance and not in what is in the heart. If we are crazy, it is for God's sake. If we are rational, it is for your sake. The love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this. One died for the sake of all. Therefore, all died. He died for the sake of all so that those who are alive should live not for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. So then from this point on, we won't recognize people by human standards. Even though we used to know Christ by human standards, that isn't how we know him now. So then, if anyone is in Christ, that person is part of the new creation. The old things have gone away. New things have arrived. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite the children to come forward. All right. I don't know if you can see really from way back there, so you might want to come closer, but I have pictures of something inside here. Want to guess what it might be? I'll give you a hint. It's an animal. What do you think now? A dog? What do you think? I guess it's a a bear. It's hard to see from just those little pictures, isn't it? Well, let's take another peek. See if I can do this so you can't see it. Okay. What do you think? A polar bear. It is a polar bear. All right. Here's going to be a tricky one. Or maybe not. Maybe this one will be a good one. We'll have to see. Sometimes you can see just the right things in the pictures. An elephant, you're right. One last one. This one is going to be very tricky. It's really hard to understand what this one is, isn't it? Let's open it up and see. Ah, it's a baby owl. Yeah. Well, why do we have pictures of little things? It is hard to see what the whole thing is from these little tiny spots, isn't it? It gets a little easier when it's a little bit bigger, when we know a little bit more, but we don't see the whole picture until we open it up like this. Sometimes we see people around us and we look just in the little holes. We look at just one thing maybe somebody did. Maybe somebody wasn't very nice to you one time and that's the way you see them all the time, just like that. Maybe you heard somebody else say that that person was mean and so then you think about them as being mean all the time. And we all make some mistakes, don't we? Yeah. God knows that we make some of those mistakes, that maybe we were mean to our brother, 
Maybe we didn't listen to our parents. God sees all of those different things that we have. And God loves us. Knowing all of those things, God sees us who we are in God and loves all of us. And our job is to not spend all of our time just looking at the things that maybe we see that are not nice, but look at people the way that God sees us as the whole picture and love and forgive people as well. So next time you go down the street and you're talking to someone or you see someone at school next time you're at school or you find somebody at the playground, think about it. Am I looking at that person in just my little, my, my little eyes? There's just these tiny little parts of them or am I seeing them as the whole person that God sees and love them as well? Let's take a little time and let's pray for that. Loving and gracious God, we thank you so much for all of the people that you put into our lives. We thank you for the people that um, help us to learn more about you and more about your love. And we ask that you would help us to open up our eyes to see the whole person as you see them. Help us to be loving and caring and help us to be forgiving. We know that you know us and we know that you know them. We are all loving in your sight. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name and all God's children said, amen. Almighty God, we gather together to worship you, to glorify your name. Lord, speak to us now in the still, quiet places of our hearts, still the noise of the world around us. Allow us to hear your spirit speak to us afresh. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our heart, be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You probably all remember that TV show that was on for a while, Extreme Makeover, Home Edition. And I loved watching that one. I used to watch it all the time. And I couldn't wait for the ending when the family, the community around them, everybody was all gathered together and they would shout, move that bus and all of a sudden this big bus would move out of the way and the family's emotions they'd burst into tears usually and amazed at this brand new house that was all of a sudden there that wasn't when they left on vacation a week earlier and 
Now there's all sorts of imperfections within the overall long-term results that happened in most of these situations. There were changes that were provided to many deserving families. Some of those families, their lives were catapulted into a great place. Others didn't really make the most of that unbelievably generous transformation, made some poor decisions, and ended up losing house. Different things happened. So, but it was fun to watch, to see that transformation that took place. Some of the early shows, it was a transformation within the same structure. Later on, it became different. In our text, we're told that Christ died for the sake of all. Some Christians, some human beings have made the most of the new life offered to them by being in Christ. And some have responded to that unbelievably generous gift of Christ's death and resurrection with full appreciation, thankful devotion. But some of them, mm, they've not made the most of it. Ty Pennington, those connected with Extreme Makeover, they couldn't control the decisions of the families after they were presented with this new home. You and I can't control the decisions of anyone else, not even those that we love the most. Sometimes maybe that's actually for the best. Sometimes our ideals maybe aren't the most ideal. But I've talked with parents of adult children who are pained. They just don't understand how or why their children don't go to church, don't seem to believe in Jesus Christ anymore. I don't know why. I've also talked with children, adult children, who don't understand how or why their parents continue to attend a church that teaches some form of Christianity that, from their adult perspective, doesn't make any sense to them. And many times I can see the truth from both perspectives. When we are in one of those perspectives or the other, it is hard to understand the other side. In today's scripture text, the Apostle Paul reminds the Corinthians that there are human opinions of who he is, how good or how bad some other human beings think that he is. These are human judgments based on external appearances, earthly standards, maybe even some of them with some ulterior motives where their judgments aren't necessarily even true. The Apostle Paul says what matters most, the only thing that truly matters is that Jesus Christ is the one who will judge Paul. That Jesus Christ is the only one who will judge each and every one of us. This is a hard lesson for us to live out as children and grandchildren of the Enlightenment. Part of our Western DNA is to rationally, scientifically assess and evaluate everything so that we can live the best life possible. And that is a great goal. But there's a hidden goal within modernity. That goal is to know and understand everything in creation so that we can live the best life possible. Did you hear what's missing out of that, that hidden portion of it? Any reference to God. The hidden goal of modernity is basically that we can live life well without God. That we wouldn't state it as such. But yet, that's the deeper unspoken truth that we're realizing. That's the truth of the world around us. We judge each other and we judge so many things by human worldly standards, scientific standards, rational standards. These words to the Corinthians are very relevant for us today. Instead of knowing by human standards, we need to have spiritual eyes that see creation from the creator's standards. Now, for some, this is harder than it is for others, just like it was in 
extreme makeover. I mean, there were certain people in that show that they had a vision to see something spectacular and what could be. And there were others that they just saw the disaster that was present and went, I don't have a clue. You have to show me. And so they would have to have some sort of virtual format of showing them to give them a glimpse of what this new vision was. Another similarity, I think, between extreme home makeover and our Christian lives is that some of the visions of the new creations that were possible within the overall framework of the home and some of those creations, those visions that they had, had to just call in a bulldozer, wrecking ball, excavator, knock it down, start from scratch, simply beyond repair. None of us ever want to admit that about our spiritual lives, and yet those people who have had to admit that. The strength that they have, it's amazing. But it's hard for us to admit those things, even if we know it's the truth. As I mentioned last week, we put on these masks and we try to fake it till we make it. Going back to what I spoke about earlier here of having spiritual eyes to see creation by the Creator's standards, we need, we need to be reminded constantly that the Creator's standards are not necessarily always articulated by certain biblical verses, especially not when those verses are lifted out of their larger context. Then sometimes those biblical standards aren't really biblical standards at all. They're human standards that we are using, God's word. The standards of the triune God who created all things, it's found in that new covenant given to us by the Son of God, Jesus Christ, when he shared that last meal with his disciples. That new commandment, love one another. Love one another. Jesus didn't say, now you know what it means to be a follower of the way. Go out and judge people accordingly. No. He didn't say, go out, control, and manage one another. No. He didn't even say, Go out and discipline one another. He said, love one another. Full stop. Love. Love so that Christ can be the judge. That, too, is hard for us to live out. I think the key to learning how we can love one another without judging may be found in verses 14 through 17 of today's text. Listen again. Paul writes, The love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this. One died for the sake of all, therefore all died. Christ died for the sake of all so that those who are alive should not live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. So then from this point on, we won't recognize people by human standards. The old things have gone away. New things have arrived. Starts out these verses by saying, the love of Christ controls us. I want to make sure we're starting from, that, from the right point here and clarify that it's not Paul's love for Christ that the love of Christ is not Paul's love of Christ, and it's not our love of Christ. It is the love of Christ for Paul, for the believers, the love of Christ for you and I. It is that love of Christ that controls you and I. Now that word controls, in the original Greek, it means to compel us. It's Suneke, which literally means to hold together. It's the love of Christ that holds us together as God's people. That is the love of Christ. It's the love of Christ that's responsible for completely changing the way Paul sees the world around him, including his perception of how to live life to the fullest. 
is perception of death as well. And that death brings forth new life. He has been held together. Remember on that road to Damascus when Christ appeared to him and blinded him? He said, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then he sat in that house on Straight Street, unable to see. And then Ananias comes in and says, you need to change. And even though I push back, I don't want to be the one here. We're here to help you change. He needed to have his entire life bulldozed. He went down to the foundation and he spent a few years rebuilding his whole life. Became one of the greatest missionaries. As Paul wrote this text we read today, I do believe that he was probably thinking about the prophet Isaiah, who wrote, Look, I'm creating a new heaven and a new earth. Past events won't be remembered. They won't come to mind. I think it may have been with that prophecy in mind. And with that prophecy in mind, I wonder, I wonder if Paul actually expected that new heaven and that new earth to burst forth at any moment. Probably. I also wonder, as descendants of the Enlightenment DNA, if we've lost some of that mystical power, that expectation, and that we just trust in doctrines and science and, oh, everything is nice and decent and orderly, and therefore, yep, it's all good. I've checked the right boxes. We've buffered ourselves from really, truly encountering the risen Christ. We need to have that same urgency, that same goal of seeing the big picture, the whole picture of Scripture, and learning to live out our faith in light of the full trajectory of faith. As I stated earlier, the creator standards are not necessarily articulated by lifting out certain verses and putting them on a tie like this. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 11, one of my favorite verses. If we don't understand the larger context, it doesn't have as much meaning. The part of a verse like this that some might say is just lifted out, put on a tie or on a plaque, part of this that gives me so much meaning is that I know it was written by a prophet who was writing to people who were in exile. They were cast out of their homeland. They were in a place that they didn't know how to worship. It's going to make reference to the fact that we were out in the middle of a park with some potential bad weather around us and we weren't in our sanctuary. Okay, God had other plans on that one. There are moments that we are in a bit of an exile, and yet we don't have a clue what that really means. It's a promise that we should be trusting God, but it's also that reminder that we are, in a sense, in exile. We are not at home with God, as the Apostle Paul puts it as well. And we should not get too comfortable with the ways of this world. One final illustration story I want to leave with you. This past week, while they were working on the parking lot and we were working at home, I was getting frustrated at our dogs. They seemed to be barking every time something moved outside, a squirrel, a bird, a car, whatever it was. And I was getting annoyed with them. And my normal command of, leave it, it wasn't working. They just fed off each other and kept barking even more. So I did a quick search, trying to figure out, okay, what can I do to train them something quick, easy? And I came across several different recommendations that basically said, every time that they started barking, don't do anything. Don't say anything. 
wait for them to look at you, and then reward them. God, that's not the answer I was looking for. That's going to take a long time to go through and retrain them. But I think that's the best way. Because I, in that moment, I thought back to my time working at a Christian camp in which the ranch foreman taught me two different ways of training horses, breaking horses for riding. People would donate horses once in a while to the Christian camp to be used for trail riding, and they weren't fit for riding yet. He said some people will just break the horse by breaking them and get them to listen to the rider's commands then they will do that. And you can ride them and they will do exactly what they're told. But that's it. The other way takes a much longer time. You have to build trust and you have to gently correct and encourage the horse when they do the right things and let them learn. He said, those horses, they too, in time, will become great trail horses and people can ride them but they are a lot more fun to ride because they still have their personality. They still have energy. They're not just that little robotic type of a being doing exactly what they're told. I thought, yeah, it takes longer, but it's probably true for the dogs as well. So what are training horses and dogs have to do with the love of Christ holding us all together? It does actually fit in, I think. What if instead of pointing out everything that others are doing wrong, even pointing out what we are doing wrong, we can admit, okay, this is wrong, but instead of pointing that out, what if we were able to regularly, consistently encourage one another, praise one another for all that we're doing right? especially in those situations when we realize we have to praise them for just that little bit that they might be doing right. And it might take a long time. What if politicians learned to do that? This has to start someplace. It's a love of Christ that holds us together, or it should be. It's not about what any one of us can do on our own. It isn't even about what a group of us might be able to do with some coordinated human effort. And it's not what we do to abide by a certain set of doctrines. It's only the sacrificial love of Christ at work in us, through us, among us, and in spite of us that allows us to see one another with the love and forgiveness of Christ and to encourage one another in the ways of being Christ to others. What we need most is the love of Christ. Let us go to God, interceding for one another, expecting the love of Christ to transform us into the new creation intended by our God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let us turn to God in prayer. Gracious God, you have created each and every one of us in your image. Remind us that it is not a physical image. It is not an outward appearance. But it is an inward attitude of our heart. The character of who we are deep inside that is to be like you. Lord, open the eyes of our hearts that we might be able to see the ways in which the world around us has shaped us and molded us to become so unlike you. Lord, allow us to be able to acknowledge the changes that need to be made within us Allow us to hear the encouragement of one another. Lord, allow us to have the willpower to turn off the noise of the world around that continues to remind us 
that the way of being the best is by knocking everyone else down. Allow our voice, your voice speaking through us, the voice of love, of compassion, of care, that silent voice of presence. Allow that to be heard by others. Lord, we give you thanks for the many, many great blessings of our life. We thank you for all that we know, for the good that we are able to do. Lord, help us to know when we need to set some of those ideals aside. When we need to be able to shout back to the world, move that bus so that we might see the new creation that you are growing within us. Lord, be with those who are unable to be present together with other believers. Be with those who are being ridiculed, punished, even murdered for belief in you. Be with those who are in the midst of surgery, illness, disease. Be with those who are broken. In this day, Lord, we ask that you be with those who do not have a human father that has set a good example. And we ask that you would allow them to see that none of us as human fathers are perfect, but only you are perfect. Lord, allow us to understand more and more that our identity is not shaped by the ways of this world and the structures that our culture have set. That our identity needs to be reshaped based off of who you are, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray this in your name, praying together the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In response to God's word, I invite the ushers to come forward to gather God's tithes, our offerings. May we place our very selves in these plates, knowing that God is reshaping us, rebuilding us, transforming us into new creations day by day.
holy God, we offer back to you a portion of that which you have entrusted to us. We offer this back in thanks, trusting that you will provide growth within our lives, growth within the lives of others, so that your kingdom may flourish until you recreate all in your time, in your vision. Amen. I invite you to remain standing for our sending him. How great is our God. How great thou art. As we go out into the world, may our hearts continue to sing how great God is. May our lives reflect how great God is. And may we find the ways to love and encourage one another. And encourage one another by letting one another know how great God is in us, among us, through us, and in spite of us. May we go out into the world learning more and more what the love of Christ is that controls us and draws us together as God's people. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.